Welcome to this webinar that will talk about the imaging in patients with aural atresia. Why and when? I'm Dr. Davide Brotto and I'm a specialist in audiology and phoniatrics from the Azienda Ospedale Università di Padova, Italy. What we call aural atresia is the absence of the external auditory canal that can be isolated or, as it is, often associated to aural microtia. The microtia is the anomaly of the pinna. Anomalies of the external ear, such as those of the pinna or those of the external auditory canal, can be easily detected in first phases of life, even in newborns. As you can see from these drawings, the anomaly of the pinna may be variable, going from a slightly reduced pinna with normal shape to the completely abnormal and absence of the pinna. Aural atresia and microtia are considered the minimal inclusion criteria for oculo-auricular vertebral spectrum that is a group of rare congenital anomalies with unknown etiology and a wide phenotypic variability. In history, multiple combinations of malformations were considered to be single entities, but now are all considered as one of many phases of the oculo-auricular vertebral spectrum. As you can see from the list below, these were some of the names that were given during history of parts of these combinations. One of the most famous names given to one of these combinations is the Golden R syndrome that is considered to be the most severe form of this spectrum. In patients affected by Golden R syndrome, aural, ocular, cervical spine and hemifacial anomalies are concomitantly present. So these patients often present auricular anomalies such as the mentioned aural atresia that can be associated to preauricular tags or microtia. As you can see from these drawings, the anomalies are easily detectable in the clinical practice and by means of imaging. Auricular anomalies can be associated to hemifacial anomalies. In these patients, what can be observed is the presence of an asymmetry between the right and the left part of the face. This is called the hemifacial microsomia that can be determined by bone or soft tissues anomalies. For example, the mandibular arch or the zygomatic arch can be abnormal or fat or muscular tissues can be missing or hypoplastic. Even ocular anomalies can be present. For example, these patients may present microphthalmia, epibulbar dermoids, anomalies in the position and or the size of the orbit or the presence of the coloboma. As you can see, these anomalies can be observed by means of clinical evaluation or by means of imaging. These patients may also present ocular anomalies such as microphthalmia, epibulbar dermoids, anomalies in position and or size of the orbit, or the coloboma. The cervical spine can also be affected by pathologies in this kind of patients. For example, vertebral fusions and morphological alterations of the vertebrae can be present. It is particularly important to detect this kind of anomalies since life support procedures often require neck hyperextension. It is very important to recognize the presence of these anomalies in order to prevent the lesions of the spine in patients affected by these anomalies. The most recent literature and some studies performed by our group showed that imaging is crucial in order to evaluate this kind of patients. MRI and CT imaging is essential in order to detect some anomalies that clinically can't be detected. For example, in our cohort of patients, 
we observe the presence of inner ear malformations, cranial nerves malformations, anomalies of the central nervous system and the internal and external carotid artery, and anomalies affecting the salivary glands. The above mentioned information can be only obtained by means of CT and MRI, but there are some questions and problems while dealing with imaging in young children. For example, toddlers and young children may require sedation to undergo CT and MRI. In addition, CT uses X-rays that are not so healthy for our body, especially when we are young children. But we must say that CT is extremely useful for rehabilitative and reconstructive surgical planning. So the question is, when should radiology be performed? There are two possible answers to this question. Some clinicians believe that radiology should be performed as soon as possible. Other clinicians believe that radiology should be performed only before surgery. Both should answer the same question, though. For example, do we need the early information, or is it radiology useful for inadequate planning? What if reconstruction will never be performed? When do we need to perform this kind of imaging? What do we know about the ear without the radiology? And what do we know about other districts? Do we need it? In order to give a possible answer to the above-mentioned question, we analyzed our patients with aural atresia who performed the CT before the 5 years old in order to understand what we did based on the clinical evaluation of these patients. So, we evaluated the clinical and radiological data of our patients currently undergoing follow-ups for aural atresia. We have 190 patients and 102 underwent CT before the 5 years old. 43 were females and 59 were males. 22 had a left atresia, 36 a bilateral atresia and 44 a right atresia. Our court performed the CT at a mean age of a little more than 1 year old. As you can see from this schematic representation, a great part of patients perform the CT before the first year of life. There are some explanations for this data. The first is that imaging is always discussed with parents. And in the first phases of life, imaging seems to give more information about the clinical status of the child for the parents. So it is a way to better understand what the possible future may be for their child. Another explanation is that in the first month of life, imaging can even be performed while the child is sleeping. So it is easier to perform and to complete a CT evaluation before the first year of life. What we observed in our court of patients is that 12% of patients presented semicircular canal anomalies, the 28% of patients present anomalies in the course of the seventh cranial nerve, the fascial nerve, and the 28th percent presented mandibular condyle anomalies. More importantly, the 6% of patients presented anomalies of the internal carotid artery and the 4% presented anomalies of the cervical vertebrae. All these information may be useful for the clinical management and for the surgical planning of multiple interventions that can be performed in this kind of patients. Concerning the characteristic features of the ocular vertebral spectrum, 
the study detected the presence of mastoid hypoplasia, maxillar hypoplasia, mandibular hypoplasia, anomalies of the zygomatic arch of the posterior cranial fossa, and hypoplasia of masticatory muscles. Imaging also provided additional information about the ear. For example, oval window atresia and round window anomalies were detected, as well as anomalies affecting the internal auditory canal and malformations of the inner ear, such as incomplete partition type 1 and enlarged vestibular aqueduct. All this information may be useful for the rehabilitative approach and for the hearing management of these patients. Also, microphthalmia and anophthalmia were detected by means of imaging. In conclusion, we can say that imaging can be performed in young children and there are some advantages to early performed the CT. CT also provides crucial information that are not detectable by means of clinical evaluation and it can explain some clinical symptoms. It is also our opinion that the CT should always be performed before the surgery. If you are an healthcare professional or a parent looking for further information about craniofacial or rare ENT anomalies, you can visit our website or contact us by means of an email. Thank you for your attention.